Good afternoon and welcome to the inaugural Hearst Community Initiative Town Hall Speaker Series. My name is Evan Zislas. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for the Aspen Institute's Hearst Community Initiative. The work of HCI is focused on promoting dialogue, increasing understanding, and facilitating opportunities for meaningful collaboration among the communities of Aspen to Parachute, Colorado, located on ancestral lands of Ute tribe. Today is the third event of an eight-part speaker series and a collaboration with the regional public libraries and chambers of commerce of Aspen, Basalt, Carbondale, Glenwood Springs, Newcastle, Silt, Rifle, and Parachute, Colorado. Every two weeks from now until the end of July, you can tune in to learn more about the issues facing our communities and the local experts working to find collaborative solutions to the shared challenges of our region. Today's topic is Ag Tech, the future of farming in rural Colorado, co-hosted by the Silt Branch Library and the Western Garfield County Chamber of Commerce. Today's Zoom host is Garfield County Libraries and interpretation to Spanish is brought to you by Velasco Language Services. Alex, if you wouldn't mind, give us some uh, instructions for how to select uh, the, the language of our choice. Of course, welcome everybody. If you allow me to share my screen so I can present that, it will just take a minute. So today's webinar, we have a couple of options for communication. We do have a chat menu. If you have any questions, uh, any technical issues that you need help with, feel free to use the chat and we will help you with that along the way. I am keeping an eye on that. We also have a Q&A. If you have any questions for our panelists today or any of our presenters, those questions that you input into the Q&A are saved for the appropriate time for when we can answer them. Finally, this is being interpreted into Spanish simultaneously. You will see an option at the bottom right of your Zoom screen that is this gridded globe icon. Go ahead and push on that and pick the uh, language of your choice, English or Spanish. If you're getting some feedback or any audio interruption, you can also click on mute original audio. If you have any questions about these functions, please type it in the chat and I will help you the best I can. With that, I will turn it back to Evan. Thanks, Alice. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, as Alex mentioned, for today's webinar, please use the chat feature for technical questions only. You may ask questions for our panel using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll leave time at the end to answer as many questions as possible. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so I want to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Corby Coomer. Corby is Executive Director of the Food and Society Policy Program at the Aspen Institute. He's also the Editor-in-Chief of Ideas, the magazine of the Aspen Institute, a Senior Editor of The Atlantic, and Senior Lecturer at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science. He's the author of The Joy of Coffee and the Pleasures of Slow Food, the first book in English on the slow food movement, and has been a restaurant critic of New York, Boston, and Atlanta magazines, and a food and food policy col columnist for The New Republic. Every week he is featured, he's a featured commentator on food and food policy on WGBH's Boston Public Radio. He has received six James Beard Journalism Awards. Food and Society at the Aspen Institute brings together public health leaders, policymakers, researchers, farmers, chefs, food makers, and entrepreneurs to find practical solutions to food system challenges and inequities. Joining Corby today, our esteemed panelists, Charles Barr, Jonathan Webb, and Jeff Lehman. Charles is founder and president of Spring Born Inc., currently building a large automated lettuce greenhouse in Silt, Colorado. A serial entrepreneur and former founder and president of the internet tech firm Webpass Inc. This is Charles's first agricultural venture, but he is excited to launch another business in Colorado. When he's not working on his lettuce operation in silt, you can find him outside hiking, racing, biking, and being dragged behind a ski boat. Also joining us today, Jonathan Webb. Jonathan is founder and CEO of App Harvest. 
Kentucky native and University of Kentucky graduate, Jonathan Webb is turning his dream of a high-tech farming hub in Appalachia into reality with App Harvest. App Harvest. The company is building some of the largest indoor farms in the world, combining conventional agricultural techniques with today's technology to grow non-GMO, chemical and pesticide-free produce. The company's first indoor farm opened in 2020 in Moorhead, Kentucky and spans 60 acres. The farm is the first of 12 the company plans to build by 2025. Jonathan strives to work alongside the hardworking men and women of Central Appalachia to build a resilient economy for the future. And lastly, Jeff Lehman. Jeff is the administrator for the town of Silt, Colorado. Jeff has been involved in local government for 40 plus years, starting as a police patrol officer in Vail. Promoted throughout the, through the ranks, Jeff became number two in charge at Vail Police Department until becoming police chief in Avon and later Eagle County under Sheriff. It could be said that police administration involves all aspects of running a business, including planning, organizing, staffing, training, reporting, budgeting, and Jeff has done it all. After leaving law enforcement, and for the last 10 years, Jeff has managed the Western Slope communities of Eagle, Vail, and now Silt. We're honored to have everyone joining us today. And Corby, with that, I'll turn it over to you. I am excited and honored to be part of this. Thank you, Evan, and all of our guests. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about, and I thought I would start with agriculture in Western Colorado. Uh, why it's important now, what are the possibilities, and Charles, you're an out-of-towner who turned yourself into a native and an expert on the region. Why were you drawn to agriculture in Western Colorado? What did you see the need as? And then tell us something about your evolution as you've made more and more trips and become more and more familiar with the region. Well, first off, thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here and I'm very pleased to, to give my two cents to this discussion. But to your question, uh, Western Colorado has a lot of advantages, right? It has a lot of agricultural advantages and it has a rich agricultural history that needs to evolve to meet the modern day challenges. So the things that are the pluses for this community in, in Western Colorado, and particularly silt, is you, you have bountiful sunshine, you're at a higher elevation as climate change changes, that becomes more of a, an asset. You have a, a bountiful land, you can go get properties out there that make it a viable uh, agricultural community. And you have historical knowledge. Uh, the agriculture community has shrunk significantly, but there are still significant agricultural knowledge in and around silt that you can tap to, to build an agricultural business. It has a lot of advantages. And I'm sure you've discovered them all. And Jeff in silt. This is music to your ears. And in fact, you might've composed some of the music. So why don't you tell us what some of the other uh, activities you are, you know about going on agricultural background and then how Charles is like excitingly reawakening this. This is not, uh, you know, just for agriculture, but of course, silt is in a federal opportunity zone, which we hope is, uh, is an economic driver for a lot of things and folks, for folks who don't know what that is, it's an initiative. It's meant to help uh, uh, regions of the country that were left behind in the last economic uh, recovery to- And you are help. an expert, because I was going to ask you to define opportunity zone, but can well, you, you go. Uh, did you have to apply for the designation or did they come to you? No, we did apply. Uh, I think uh, everyone applied. It's based on census tracts. And so it's not just the town of Silt town of Silt's footprint, it actually goes out well into the county, which uh, is able to accommodate uh, Charles's new business because it's, it's just outside of town. So it's still within the opportunity zone. So it does give certain uh, advantages to businesses. And I, you know, we don't need to go into all that here, but um, it, it certainly is a big deal to towns like us. And, and we have other businesses in town uh, that have uh, also, um, uh, or hopefully will benefit uh, by using the opportunity zone. So that's, that's one thing that's important. I think additionally, um, we have a willing uh, 
we have willing a willing populace to get involved in this. As Charles mentioned, there's a lot of history here in agriculture, and um, and we went through a program with the uh, Utah State Western Rural Development uh, Center to try to match community needs or community goals with the needs of certain industries. And agriculture was right at the top of the list as, as we went through that process. So this really fits in with what I think the folks in SILT are looking for. And finally, you know, we have skilled labor out here and uh, we have a lot of people who um, have have skills that, that could be uh, tapped into, especially with a, a high tech sort of environment that, uh, that I think Charles is looking for people that have mechanical skills and, and, and could be converted to solar or robotics or whatever, uh, because these guys have worked in oil and gas industry, tinkering with machines for a long time. So I think uh, we do have that uh, skilled labor force out here that, uh, that I think a lot of people would love to be able to drive the, the half a mile out of town to go work for Charles or an outfit like his instead of driving all the way up to the Rangeley oil fields or to uh, you know the tourist industry in Aspen and, and Vail and, and or even in Mesa County that we 90 plus percent of our workforce drives out of town to go to work every day and for every job we can get closer to home is a win for us. That's great. Jonathan, you've been hearing robotics, you've been hearing workforce, you've been hearing opportunity uh, in a rural area, and I think you're an expert on all of those. Could I ask you to talk about what it's like in your own region, but also a definition, if I'm not putting you on the spot. Ag tech. We know what we're mentioning it today. We're thinking about it. Charles <clears throat> is going to tell us more about the tech in his own new operation, but how do you define ag tech and your own activity in it? Well, yeah, I guess technology itself is pretty broad. I mean, I, I per, you know, we use the word, you know, we use the phrase ag tech here, but I mean, you can make the argument that ag tech maybe started when the tractor was introduced and has never stopped since. So it's, it's all relative, I guess, but, you know, we, we, we try to, you know, the way we frame it is, you know, the last big technological revolution that hit American farming was the tractor and it startled farmers and you know, people weren't in up, some people were in an uproar and then, you know, had to wrap our head around, well, it just means less donkey and less oxes and I can, you know, get, sit on this thing and get much higher productivity and much higher yield. So actually that's a good thing. Uh, but robotics, AI, and you, know, you talk about big data and that gets, you know, it's, it's like, it's a little startling. It might, you know, be uncomfortable. What's it mean? What's it gonna do? Um, but it's just the world we're in and the world, the, where the world's going. And, you know, every industry is gonna be heavily impacted by those three pillars of robotics, AI, and, and the way in which we use and co collect data. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, I mean, that ag tech itself is, you know, kind of in that bucket of what does new age agriculture look like? You know, and, and it, it's going to take a lot of different forms, depending on the community, depending on the region, you know, depending on the attributes of that region. Uh, but here at Harvest, uh, we're based in central Appalachia. Uh, we're here because of water, number one. I mean, 95% of a fruit and vegetable is water. Uh, so we're, we're running completely on recycled rainwater. Uh, and we're able to do that because we have an abundant amount of rainfall here. Climate change... Uh, we need to, so my background was solar. I was a part of building large solar projects before App Harvest. So one form of energy and then now over to agriculture. But, you know, whether, whether or not we like climate change or agree with it or whatever, you know, whatever political party, you know, it's happening. And now the reality is what do we do to deal with it? And part of it is, yes, we can try to slow things down or, uh, but then also there's the sheer reality that it's happening and it's rolling out before our eyes. So for us, Climate change has made Kentucky wetter. Uh, our, our wettest decade on state history has been this decade, and three of our wettest years on state record have been in this decade. And, and then you look at California, uh, you look at New Mexico, you look at much of the Southwest, you know, getting drier, more wildfires, more drought. And, and so as we're using technology to, to build new systems, 
you know, we, we need to really just look at the maps too and better understand how is that, how is climate change going to affect our communities? Because if, you know, Charles and Jeff and everybody are building wonderful assets in your community and, you know, but these, this is infrastructure we can't pick up and move. And, you know, we need to all as, as leaders in our community and a part of our region, you know, understand where are we at today? How is climate change going to affect our communities and what attributes is, is our, is our community going to have to offer uh, for us here, a, a big significant uh, piece to why we're here is is rainwater. Another one is is the people. I, you know, it, we're all everybody's very biased on their region, and I love it. Uh, we we love our region. Uh, it's it's been known for coal coal country, eastern Kentucky, West Virginia. Uh, we think we have an incredible workforce of ingenuity and tenacity. Uh, but but we have to we have to get excitement into agriculture, and that's what I'd love to hear in Colorado. What you all are doing. You know, what we found is, you know, high school kids, they want to be a doctor, they want to be a lawyer, they want to be an accountant. You know, we're not teaching our young people that there's pathways in agriculture. You know, the average age of the American farmers in their 60s. And, you know, we'd love to hear, Corby, what, you know, what you all and what this group thinks of how do we inspire young people to, to want to actually be in this field? That's the most wonderful question. But before we ask Charles to tell us more about his own business and how technology factors into that, um, Jonathan, I wish you could give us an example of what App Harvest does, what it is, and some of the work you've been engaged in in Kentucky, I think. So we, we just went public on the NASDAQ under APPH. Uh, we we um, did that as, as part of a way to be fully transparent with our consumers. And being public is, uh, has been brutal, frankly, the last six months. Very not enjoyable process, but it is what you it is. It? Uh -huh. No, no, because I think we, we have an obligation to, to be transparent and this forces us to a higher threshold. We're a public benefit corporation. We're a B Corp. Uh, we're, we're, there's only four publicly traded companies that are both a public benefit corp and B Corp. But what we're doing is uh, we're growing fruits and vegetables, uh, utilizing technology. We acquired a, a, a robotics and AI company, Root AI, uh, and and we're building facilities. Uh, our first facility was 60 acres under glass. We have a few more facilities under construction. Uh, by the end of 2022, we'll have five operating facilities and uh, we use 90% less water than open field agriculture. We get 30 times yield per acre. Uh, we don't use the, the harsh chemical pesticides. Uh, and if you look at, we, we had the UN Security Council here about a year ago, the UN said, we need 70% more food by 2050. Uh, humans need to produce more food between now and 2050 than in the last 10,000 years of human existence. Uh, and we're going to have to use technology and it's going to look different in every community. It'll look different with different companies. Uh, but, but here at App Harvest, we're, uh, we're, we're building large facilities in central Appalachia uh, and, and utilizing technology to, to, to grow a fruit and vegetable uh, with far less land and far less water. Great. I have a feeling Charles has similar experience in uh, near around silt to talk about. So Charles, tell us what brought you to silt and Springborn. It's very much the same story. Just to build on what Jonathan said, all his points are true, right? That the need for food, the need for less water, less land utilization to get that food, all of that's true. And it's also the diversity of supply, right? In, in California, you know, my native state, there's a a ton of fruits and vegetables that we grow here and ship all over the world, that's not gonna continue, right? That, that food supply source has to get closer to the mouths that are eating it. And the way to do that is through technology and through greenhouses and through controlled environment agriculture. All of this food production needs to be diversified. It needs to be closer to the people that eat it. And it needs to frankly, employ more people. The more people that you employ, the broader that base of knowledge gets, the more entrepreneurial spirit comes out, the more ideas are generated, and the more innovation you can create. If there's only five farmers that have you know, 10,000 acres of soybeans, you're not gonna get a ton of innovation. But if there's 10,000 farmers with five you know, acres doing something, you're gonna get a lot more new ideas, new thoughts, new breakthroughs, and new ways to push food production forward close to the area of the people that are gonna eat it. Um, and all that helps climate change, right? It employs people close to home. It keeps, it keeps you know, diesel trucks off the interstate going from here to there. 
and make sure that people are good stewards of the land, right? And good stewards of their community. And that's what agriculture is. I mean, part of the word agriculture is culture. It is the basis of our society. And the more we distribute that throughout the, throughout the United States and the more people are involved and the more youth that we get into it, the better we as a society are gonna be. And you find all that in Western Colorado, right? You find people that wanna do all those things. You have found it. Could you paint us a picture of Springborn's plant and what, whether you've done anything like this before or if you just completely pivoted in a career and decided this looks good. I like the people in Silt. It's an opportunity zone. I'm going. I completely, personally, I completely pivoted, right? I have never done anything in our culture before, but I see the need for, for exactly what I just said, new entrants or new people in this field. And as J Jonathan alluded to earlier, you know, they need to be young. They can't all be, you know, retired and then become farmers. So for me, it was a total pivot. And the reason that I like the pivot into a new career is I believe that new people that come into an industry and look at it from a new angle are helping everybody, right? I hate it when people tell me that's just the way it's done, right? The industry standard is blah, 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 right? Whenever I hear the industry standard, I think, mm, we should look at that, right? Because there's a better way to do it. Um, so for me, it's a total pivot and it's a new eyes and it's a new way of approaching this business. And, and I'm excited about it. Tell us what the it is. Paint us a picture of what your physical plant looks like, how many people work there, what it's like to walk through the door. Uh, it's two and a half acres under glass. It's got an acre and a half processing facility. There's 18 lines, all growing various leafy greens. Um, the average cycle for the, the plant is about 22 days. So we have different cultivars growing, but it's roughly 22 days on average to get through that cycle. No human hand touches the lettuce as a way to avoid uh, pathogens. Um, as soon as it comes, it's all automated. So it's seeded, plant or seeded, germinated, grown, cut, put in the package and, and into a cardboard box before anyone touches it. You say you just reel off two and a half acres under glass like we on our daily drives pass two and a half acres under glass all the time. Um, it sounds really extraordinary. I know they exist elsewhere in Europe, the only place I've seen them. Do they exist in other counties in Colorado that you've seen? And then can you tell us something about the climate control and how your energy needs are different from the vertical farms we've read so much about? Yes, okay, so two parts. No, I don't know, if, I have seen some other, uh, food greenhouses in Colorado, but as we all know, Colorado is, most of the greenhouses are for cannabis. Um, so it's good to have a second, second growth of greenhouse for construction there, but there are, there are probably five or six other growers under, under glass in Colorado, some in the urban centers and some spread out. Um, the second part of your question was, I forgot. First of all, by glass, I assume you mean some kind of reinforced plastic, not actual breakable glass. Yes, that's a euphemism. It's re, it's it is a diffused plastic, so it's corrugated plastic. So there's no shadows in the greenhouse. Every you know, the the light is diffused and it spreads everywhere. So you get the maximum amount of energy on those plants. That's fantastic. Do you have louvers that open? There's a the shade. Yeah. So when it gets too hot, the whole sides open up and it's a big swamp cooler and fog comes in. The fans will change the air over in that greenhouse about once a minute and cool it down. And then the opposite, the opposite, it has radiant heat in the floor. So when it's too cold, you know, do you have hot water going through the floor to keep the temperature where it is? And that's kind of the predictive climate technology. We know what the weather's going to be in an hour and the systems change in preparation for what's coming. Um, so, it was, it, so it's hot water. I was asking about the energy inputs into this. Do you have any kind of coolant besides mechanical fans? Just fans It's and water, right? You, you run the, the hot air through the water and it, it's basically a large swamp cooler and it will cool it down. But you want humidity in a greenhouse so you don't want traditional AC because that dries everything up. It has to be agricultural cooling um, and it works and it works very well. But to your point about energy, that's the other thing about Western Colorado is it's, you know, has tons and tons of natural gas and natural gas is the source for the heat. Oh, I see, okay. Because when I was reporting on 
vertical farming and the whole movement and the unbelievable amounts of venture capital that were going into it, a big knock on it was all of the cooling systems in these enclosed, often brick-sided structures and that the energy inputs were impractical. It sounds like you've solved that. We try and work with nature as much as possible, right? It's the baseline, but we do modify it because it is controlled environment agriculture. So you heat it, you cool it, we try and keep it inside within a band of five degrees. You know, there's a few, a few, a few elements you try and control. It's, it's temperature, it's humidity, it's carbon dioxide content um, and light. You want all those things to be within your parameters. Great. And Jonathan, does App Harvest help people who use App Harvest to understand their energy inputs, their needs, and how they can change those? So we're not in the energy business. My previous job to this, I built solar projects, but we're just buying our energy off the grid and, and we're working with our utilities here. And I would say, you know, some, you know the work we're doing here at what this country does not do a good job of at all. I was in DC before moving back to Kentucky is you know, we have no master plans where every, every CEO is incentivized by quarterly earning calls. I had my first quarterly earning call yesterday and I was trying to make it clear we're, you know, we're, we're judging ourselves by the first decade, second decade, third decade. You know, we have every politician is running the moment they win, they're running their next campaign for reelection. Um, and there's so much, policy that could go into place for this industry, which is, you know, we're consuming energy. So, you know, upgrading the, you know, the local power grids and substations, you know, we're pushing our utilities to build uh, renewable energy alongside what we're, you know, the assets we're developing. Uh, but we're, we're in the fruit and vegetable business. We're building uh, assets to, to grow a fruit and vegetable, and we're just pulling our energy uh, off of the grid. Uh, and and we, we've had great conversations with our local utilities, with, with our governor or governor's office and everyone here who's, who's trying to wrap an overall strategy around the development of this industry. Uh, but, but there's a lot, that's, that, the challenge is the opportunity. The challenge is we don't do a good job in the U.S. of creating overall solutions and then moving forward to the, on, on those together. But the opportunity in every region and every state is you know, can be doing that on your own. And we're doing that here in Kentucky, which is our governor has made ag tech uh, the number one economic development priority for the state. Uh, he, he's toured our facility. He's going to be going to the Netherlands with us when it opens up. You mentioned Europe. Um, and the good thing is these solutions really all sit in the Netherlands. I mean, I don't know, Charles, where, you know, your, your technology partners are, or who you're working with, but there's a whole deep bench of technology providers in the Netherlands. They have a country nearly a third the size of Kentucky in landmass with 30,000 acres of high-tech production uh, for fruit and vegetables. You look at the U.S., we have roughly 1,500 acres of low-tech greenhouses. And, and you mentioned, Corby, when you said two and a half acres and you're driving by it, what can somebody visualize? A greenhouse is not a greenhouse is not a greenhouse. And what we try to say is like a 1950 sports car and a 2021 Tesla. The only two things they have in common are they have four wheels and a steering wheel. Uh, and similar to, you know, a, a top of the line CEA facility, uh, we're all growing CEA, fruits and vegetables. what do you mean? Tell us what CEA means. Controlled environment agriculture, CEA. So, uh, you know, using sensors and software to control the climate, you know, optimize for production. We're, and this is a good point too. You mentioned, you know, vertical or indoor uh, in a warehouse versus indoor in a glass structure. We were agnostic. Our team, you know, we had a background in energy and we just looked at how can we use as few possible inputs to grow fruit and vegetable, which ultimately is energy for the human. And there was no way we could wrap our head around not using sunlight and rainwater and somehow being sustainable or cost competitive. So using all those technologies, data, AI, robotics, LED lights, climate control, sensors, software, taking all that, but instead of putting it in a black warehouse and putting it in a structure where you know, we use sunlight first, we only turn our LED lights on 
when we're not getting the micromole light from the sun that we need. Uh, we run completely on recycled rainwater, and, and that's great because we oh, to local communities, we're not pulling any water from your local community. We're self-reliant, and we have no water discharge, so we have no agriculture runoff. But that's also that resiliency is also making us cost competitive with Mexico, where you know at the end of the day, if I'm we're selling to Kroger, we're selling to Walmart, we're selling to Wendy's, you know we have to be able to sell at the same price of these imports coming in from Mexico, which frankly, you look at Charles and anyone else, it's none of the CEA companies were competing with one another because the competition is really singular. It's Mexico and then California. Charles mentioned it, not me, but you know, I'm sitting in coal country where every coal company went bankrupt in the last 10 years. If we're not having honest, hard conversations with farmers in California to transition them out of farming, that's a shame on politicians and that's a shame on everyone that doesn't believe Salinas Valley is the next coal country. There is no humanly way possible with the amount of drought and wildfire and lack of fresh water that California is going to continue to be the mecca of American farming. It's just it, zero chance it's going to happen, but we have to sit down and have those hard discussions. Uh, and then to Charles' point, we can distribute that production throughout the U.S., use technology, bring imports back from Mexico into the U.S., but it's going to take a lot of planning. And that's where, frankly, Corby, these discussions are so helpful. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to be a part of it is, you know, I, Colorado does have incredible assets. I mean, you, you, you all do have legal marijuana. We don't in, in Kentucky, but there's a lot of similarities on the indoor growing practice, the LED lights, uh, that you know, a Colorado is is very well positioned to to be be a leader in this industry. Uh, but but it's going to take you know it's going to take people like Charles and Jeff and and many others kind of building out that robust robust strategy. Great. I'm going to ask Jeff about how to promote that regionally and take these exciting uh, technologies that Charles and Jonathan are talking about. But Jonathan, I want to clarify two things. Who doesn't believe that Salinas County is the next coal country? Is that sly dig saying if you keep depleting all of the increasingly scarce resources of Salinas, all you can do is go underground and mine coal because you'll have wrecked its natural resources? No, I mean the way coal, like the way we we mined all the coal in Central Appalachia. Yeah. I mean, we're mining our soil soils, Corby. You know this better than all of us. I, I'm new to farming, but it, it's heart wrenching. And I mean, I get emotional when I, you know, we're mining the nutrients out of our soil. You know, the UN has said we have 60 years left of fertile topsoil. My friends in coal country, all, all, all the operators went bankrupt. My friends got laid off and we demonized coal as this like end all be all. It's the worst thing on planet earth, which yes, it has a lot of problems, but it also powered the America through the industrial revolution. But we're mining nutrients out of our soil and we're, they're not being replenished. We're taking water out of watersheds and they're not being replenished. Agriculture right now in its current form is just another extractive industry. And California has been extracting all the nutrients and all the water out of its aquifers, out of its soils, and it's, it's tapped out. There are 10, 15, 20, 30 years left. I mean, my lifetime, your our, our lifetime, it there's going to be a slow transition and we need to be sitting with farmers going, how are we going to prepare you for what's coming? Uh, and if not, the farmer in California is going to face exactly what the the energy uh, uh, operator did here in central Appalachia. And when when it happens, it happens quick. And, and to anyone that thinks transition can't happen quickly. I welcome you to come meet with anyone that worked in coal in Central Appalachia 10 years ago. They're all laid off. We are going to record that. My bookshelf is full of books that give similar warnings, but not as eloquently or tersely as you. Jeff, how do you, in your Opportunity Zone, promoting Town of Silt and whole county, how do you think that more and more counties, even if they're not as enterprising as getting Opportunity Zone designation, will be able to attract and promote these kinds of technologies. And is it part and parcel of the selling argument to incorporate not being extractive, preserving more natural resources when trying to sell 
a town council, for example, on what could look like an overly technology driven company with robotics that are denying people jobs. How do you try to sell it to county officials and locals? Well, I'm a huge fan in collaboration and uh, we our, our region here between the towns of Parachute Rifle, uh, Glenwood Springs, and Newcastle and Silt, we already collaborate on a number of different things in different areas. And uh, I think it's just a, it's just a larger, uh, you know, a larger example of that is, is just to get together and start, uh, start pushing this idea that we have what, uh, what the world needs in terms of uh, enough water to run these programs. And certainly like, like Charles mentioned, all the sunlight. Um, you know, I can only talk about my little town of 3200 and the surrounding region, which is largely agricultural, but the people I've talked to welcome this opportunity to have a, uh, I mean, this idea that we could have this ag tech operation right in the middle of this old fashioned agricultural community is, is, has been pretty well received. They see the, the, uh, the jobs that are created here um, and they also understand in big agriculture, you know, there's fewer and fewer family farms and more and more, um, you know, more and more corporate farms. And they talk about this idea that, uh, gosh, if I want to get my fingers, keep my fingers dirty and, and, you know, be able to work in this environment, I'm going to have to think of, of another way to do it. So, uh, you know, I sense that people here are really open to the idea. And uh, of course, I can't speak for everybody. There's probably some old fashioned folks around. Uh, but I know that there are people here who really back this idea and, and look at it in, 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 you know, in, in a bigger picture. But I think the key to attract uh, our town council here will be, uh, you know, very uh, supportive of anything that brings jobs to the Silt region. And keeps people from having to drive, you know, uh, 90 minutes one way to work every day, uh, unless they just absolutely really want to do that. So um, it, it, I think it takes a, takes a big coordinated effort to make that happen. Great. Um, Charles, what were, when we were just hearing Jonathan's really eloquent talking points about this and Jeff's here's why it's so good for the region, when you were coming in and getting whatever designations you had to, to build your own business. Did you find that certain talking points with local people you met worked better than others and there were certain aspects you needed to de-emphasize? No, I mean, my philosophy is just let it put it all on the table, the good, bad, and the ugly. But with these, with these projects, there's not a lot of ugly. And Garfield County and the town of Silt were very, very welcoming. And we, when I first came out there and had this discussion about, you know, can I get permits for this? Will you allow this type of land usage? Will you allow this type of business? Is this something you want in your region? Uh, you know, the elected officials were resoundingly positive and resoundingly welcoming. So that was very, very nice. And that gives you a good sense of what's going on. And then one day, we, you know, before I bid, just started construction, I walked up and down Main Street Silt walked into all the businesses, introduced myself, told people what I was doing and just asked what their opinion was. And by and large, everybody's opinion was very positive. Like that sounds great. We want, we want jobs here. And these are good paying jobs. I mean, the, the starting salary for everything is 25 bucks. So it's a, good, it's a good paying job in the region. And we've already hired people directly from town who come, you know, they just cross the river and they work in the greenhouse. There will be about 20 jobs when we're all said and done, maybe 25. And if we, if, if we do the other expansion, that would double. So there's 25 good paying jobs for people that are there. And the, the workforce that we've hired comes from Battlement, comes from Silt, comes from Rifle. You know, it comes from that area. One gentleman, to Jonathan's point, moved from Southern California, working on a farm, saw the writing on the wall, and he moved, he moved back to Colorado because his wife is from Rifle, and now he's one of the growers in the greenhouse. So people see the transition and they, they want to participate. I had a feeling that that person who moved from Southern California might have a family connection. Um, um, you've just given us such a good 
picture of the jobs you'll create and, and the attractions of them. Um, and for you and Jonathan, thinking in terms of social justice, environmental sustainability, uh, nutrition, I think we've talked a bit about community resilience, but I think everybody who is trying to go into a new business sector or thinking of promoting a business sector wants to be able to slot in to helping those causes. Do any of those, Jonathan, um, have a lot of resonance to the businesses you help and the businesses you start out? I'll, I'll give you the list again. Uh, social justice, sustainability, we've certainly talked about environmental sustainability. Um, economic mobility, we've talked about jobs. Um, nutrition and community resilience. So nutrition, community resilience, and social justice, let's talk about. Yeah, it, it's it's resonating. And I mean, you can look at Kentucky on a map. There's no uh, hiding, you know, who the federal delegation of, uh, of leaders are. And, and this is a this is a left and right issue. I mean, we I, I we've been so encouraged by part leaders from both parties and, you know, individuals from both parties that, you know, food is something we all have in common. We all eat. And, and it is one thing that if, if our country really doesn't screw this conversation up, it really can bring us to the table. Uh, and we found that from, you know, like Charles said, on Main Street and in the various communities where we're working all the way up to uh, Capitol Hill and senators on both sides of the aisle. And yeah, there's so, so ESG, environmental social governance, uh, our company is deeply committed, you know, again, to the forward looking uh, very long-term investments we make. An example of that, we've spent nearly $500,000 in high school education in Eastern Kentucky. And that's because we're not just building facilities, we're building an ecosystem. Uh, and frankly, we couldn't rely on the federal government or even state governments to, to lead on education. So we're just putting technology at high schools. That ROI on that investment has been outstanding. You know, you have communities begging us to build facilities, doing everything we can to get permitting, uh, attracting talent. We've hired near, we've hired 500 people in the middle of COVID. So when people question, you know, people want to work, and you look at the jobs numbers, you look at labor numbers. I can't speak for other companies, but at our company, we've had 8,000 people apply to work at our company in the middle of COVID. We hired 500 in the middle of COVID. And when you give people a purpose and more than just a paycheck, yes, we pay a living wage. We offer full benefits to every employee. We pay the, pay the premiums. We found that employees would end up electing not to even take the health care if they had a small premium because they could they didn't want it to come out of their paycheck. So we we paid the it's been the best investment we could have ever made. And again, the private sector in the US is very much demonized and, and in some ways rightfully so. But we, we can be a part of all these macro problems. We can be a part of the solution, but we have to build good companies. And, and the one thing I would say about agriculture where we have an opportunity, you know, and I, I look forward to visiting and hopefully being able to see what you all are doing in Colorado. Uh, we talk about essential workers. We talk about essential workers in COVID. There is no, re our competition in Mexico and the reality is we have people making $5 a day you know, no health care. Uh, you, you cannot track the illegal pesticides that are being used. Uh, if food is going on a shelf to a major grocer in the U.S., or if it's being sold at a major outlet, everybody working in food and working to put food on tables should make a living wage and should have full health care. We're doing it. It sounds like Charles is doing it. Why can we not make that happen in our agriculture system? We can, uh, it's just going to take a lot of technology and political leadership and private sector capital. But, you know, that there is so much opportunity. I came from the energy world and I, I, we see so much more opportunity in agriculture to, to have broad change on many different metrics uh, than, than even energy is pretty singular. I mean, we're trying to the, the energy world's trying to solve for one thing, less carbon uh, here. You know, you can pick 20, 30 different social issues that you know, food and agriculture uh, and, and using technology can, can really help solve so many different issues. And that's where it is going to take communities, 
coming together, you know, building companies, not just a company in and of itself, but, you know, a holistic community mindset. Oh, wow. Charles. First up, I think that was very well said, Jonathan. I agree with everything you said there. And I would add just a couple things. The first one is the jobs that are provided have to also provide dignity. And these are dignified jobs. Agriculture is a dignified profession. And sometimes we as a culture kind of minimize that. And that's not right. So the people that we see coming into our facility, they want to grow food. They want to have a purpose. They want to join a company that values them and you know, will allow them to grow, grow their skills, grow their knowledge, advance their society, advance their personal human capital. And that's what these jobs provide. And we see that over and over again with the eagerness of the people that come in. And the second thing is these jobs, back to the dignity portion of it, I'm not asking these employees to do anything that they wouldn't do to their friends and neighbors. Where so many of the uh, entry level jobs, the first thing that the employer asks them to do is something that they don't wanna do, right? Charge somebody $75 to put a bag on an airplane. Uh, you know, do you really wanna do that? Most people don't. But these jobs give a good sense of dignity, a good sense of purpose, and a good sense of community to, mm -hmm. the, to the local region. And the second thing I'd just like to add on again to Jonathan's comments is this, these technologies are new, but over time, these technologies should trickle out into the traditional farmers. So I'm approaching this, I pivoted, I'm going all in on data and, and intelligence and robotics and all this other stuff. But I also have 250 acres that is traditionally farmed. And these two, two disparate things are coming together. And we know this will be a success for agriculture and for America when you see small farmers adopting small greenhouses and tailoring them to the inputs of their particular circumstances. That's when we know that this is gonna be a very big success. And to start, you start with these employees, they're not gonna work for me forever. They're gonna work at Springborn for three years. They're gonna learn something and they're gonna start their own business. And that's good for the community and that's good for me and that's good for the nation. Um, wow, you, you guys, I, I, you know, I, I want to put you at speaker's corner. I want to have uh, many, many transcripts of your really uh, eloquent uh, remarks. The only last question before we open it up as, as we will is about regional alliances. So Charles, you're talking about the idea that I'm really preparing people to go into the workforce and do their own innovation and follow their own careers and passion. Um, but we're, we're talking here about regional stakeholders, Aspen Vale Resorts, community colleges, regional high schools, small business owners, uh, energy is the outdoors, health and wellness. Jeff, have you tried to get any of those local businesses or attract um, entrepreneurs like Charles uh, into these um, sort of cross-sector collaborations or right now is it one thing at a time? One kind of business at a time. Probably probably the latter. Yeah, you know, we, we have identified through that uh, ASAP project with Utah State, a number of businesses, and it's not just agriculture, but it's a number of businesses that we have, we think we have, you know, the, the right, uh, you know, the right things here for those companies to come and, and relocate here. But frankly, we lack the resources to even sit down and, and put together a letter writing campaign to try to get them to, to come. So uh, that's something we're trying to look forward to. But that's why I say it's really a regional kind of approach. It's, it's not just one of, one of these small towns that should do it. It's, it's uh, you know, engage with uh, Garfield County and their economic development people, probably the state's economic development people, and really try to put this on all of their radar screens. I've, I've done this with some of my, uh, my fellow uh, town managers uh, and they're ex excited to learn more. Uh, but I, you know, I think we just need to do more to get, it, to get the word out. Great that you've talked to your fellow city managers. Evan, may I invite you back and uh, you can bring us some of the questions that might have come in or ask your own. Um, great. The, you, you know, so so many of the questions that have come in, you guys have already touched on, but there's more to unpack here. Um, first of all, um, Jonathan, you were saying that in where you are in Kentucky, climate change has really resulted in an excess of rainfall. 
we have the opposite problem as a result of, of uh, climate change, and that is pervasive drought. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your operation in terms of what is the need, is there an amount of rainfall that is optimal? If we are suboptimal, uh, what is the workaround there for, for our region? Well, either way, controlled environment agriculture is far better than open field on water conservation. But to be abundantly clear, you know, I, I, I don't even have grass where I live. Everywhere around me is a garden. So my front, you know, the front is a garden, the back is a garden. Everyone should grow fruit and vegetables at home. I'm a huge fan of Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry's a Kentuckian. You know, we, there's great respect for the four season organic farmer. And what we're trying to displace is the open field, heavy chemical pesticide laden, uh, resource sucking agriculture. So there's four season organic farmers, Let's support them and prop them up and prioritize that. But then no matter where you're at, whether you have a lot of water or a little water, uh, we still use 90% less water than open field agriculture. Now for us, you know, because we're water rich, we've been able to not only use 90% less water, uh, which I'm sure Charles's statistics are fairly similar in his operation. I don't know, maybe it's 95, but somewhere in that range, less water than open field ag, but we also then only use recycled rainwater. So we're collecting all the water on our roof, put it in a retention pond, filter it only with sand and UV, no chemicals. Uh, if you don't have that abundant water, then you're gonna likely be connected to city water, uh, but it's still 90% less water. So it, it's either way, it's far less water. Uh, and then whether in a drought stricken region or, or a very water rich region, uh, yeah, it, it's still a much less press on local water. Um, I would I would ask, what was your process? I know you're from Kentucky, and I, I know you went to school there, uh, and you were excited about coming home to Kentucky, so to speak, uh, to, to with your first operation. What are the determining factors or the metrics that you look at when you when you look at a region to try to decide if it's a, a viable uh, region for for an operation like app harvest because I know you're expanding and you're getting you're, you're getting bigger and you're adding more locations what are the determining factors that that help you to decide if, if a region is a, is a is a viable solution for you well it's it's definitely going to be all across the country and that's already happening and it's slowly rolling out I mean I I, we phrase it as we feel like we're in the third wave of sustainable infrastructure, but we're we're in the infancy. I mean, 20 years ago, it was renewable energy, and now there's been billions go into almost every state on building out renewable energy. 10 years ago, you know, Tesla made electric vehicles popular in the mainstream, and now every major automotive company is moving into electric vehicles. And right now, you know, it, it appears we're in our infancy of controlled environment ag, but the way Charles is in Colorado and you look at other companies all up and down the East Coast, it's slowly popping up. You know, but for us, we're zero focused right here on Central Appalachia. We have you know, abundant rainwater. We can get to 70% of the U.S. in a day drive, uh, and we have a great workforce. So we're hyper focused here. But you know, part of being on this call and, and you know, to meeting folks in Colorado is we just want to be supportive. I, I don't look at anybody is competition, we see it as colleagues and whether that's Wendell Berry and his friends that are doing it right in the open field or someone like Charles in Colorado, you know, we, we just have to, we have to grow food with less chemicals, uh, less water uh, and, and, and use less land and, and work together. And, you know, Corby, I would, I'd put it on you all and Evan to think, you know, how do we get a letter and we already have sent letters to Secretary Vilsack and Ron Klain, and everybody in DC, but you know, our governor will gladly engage. Can we get the governor of Colorado to engage? And we keep pushing on DC to actually create some robust policy that's gonna help people like Jeff get the resources he needs to, to attract more companies like Charles. We'd love to throw our hat in the ring and, and be a participant and helpful if there's any way to do that with Colorado. Our job is to take you up on offers like that. So we're going to find a way of doing that but you have entirely made my day by mentioning often Wendell Berry, and you will make everybody on this call's lives better for sending them to read some Wendell Berry, your friend and neighbor. Um, I, want, I want to go back to Jeff for just a second. Um, the region here in Western Garfield County in particular, um, Silt is right in the middle of, of Western Garfield County. 
Um, that part of Colorado has, has heavily relied on oil, the oil and gas industry for so long, and it's represented um, pretty important um, mechanism for economic uh, vitalization, I should say. And with the loss of that industry, as oil and gas continues to pull up stakes in Western Garfield County, um, we're, we're, as a region, continuing to look for emerging industries that might take the place of some of those high paying jobs. Um, Jeff, I wonder, can you speak to a little bit about what, what is the buzz? What are people talking about? What are the kinds of emerging industries that people might be open to? Um, and, and is there any overlap with, with what we're just talking about today? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we worked with uh, Utah State on this survey where we surveyed our residents and we surveyed businesses and what they were looking for. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, agriculture came up really high on that list, as did some other things like uh, some service industries and so forth that service uh, the resort communities. Um, but uh, I, I think people are very uh, receptive to uh, businesses like this. I think the old timers will be, uh, you know, I've heard some people say, well, you know, that's no longer going to be pasture land or it's no longer going to be land that produces hay. Well, you know what? Um, I think the majority of folks that I've talked to think that this is, this is really uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the way of the future. So anything we can do to attract this, I think, um, will be welcome by especially we, as we grow, uh, more and more people moving to this, and I'm anxious to see, I haven't even seen the new census on what silt looks like today, but we see people moving from the resort areas down this way a lot, and they're going to be more receptive and more, um, you know, more uh, supportive of this kind of industry than maybe the old timers here. But you're going to see more and more folks coming down this way, we see them coming from the front range. They're the ones buying some of these homes uh, that we have going up in our in our community. So I think it's on, I think it's happening. Whether we want it to or not. Yeah. <laughs> we've heard a little bit uh, from Charles about the, the kinds of jobs that, that he's brought to the region. Jonathan, I wonder if you could speak just briefly on um, the kinds of jobs. You said you, you hired 500 people during during the pandemic, what are the types of jobs that, that we're talking about that go into an operation of, of your scale? I mean, the good the good thing for us and the hard thing for our hiring team is it's just a it's just wide net. So we have you know plant science, we have you know robotics engineers, we have uh, people developing software for AI, all the way to an entry level job that's you know crop care specialist. You know, but what I've tried to say to even our entry level employee and I, we had a meeting with our team today on this, which is, you know, best idea wins and our entry level team that's making a living wage and, you know, has full benefit, uh, good benefits. We're upskilling them where there's nowhere to go get. And Charles, I mean, I'm sure you're seeing the same. There's no real college that's pumping out PhDs or, you know, giving master degrees and what we're really doing. I mean, the best and most talented people in this industry have done it through just doing it. So our entry level workforce, their opportunity to scale within our company as we build and grow uh, is really just going to be a limit that how quickly can they learn and get in different roles. So you know, the great thing about the industry is there's entry level all the way up to, to very high end. And there's the ability for the entry level employee to scale within the organizations uh, because they're simply not uh, so much of it's going to be learning on the job and that talent and knowledge you're developing internally, you know, people's ability to grow within the company is, uh, is very likely because we're not going to be looking outside of the company as much as we are developing talent within the company. Um, I could spend another hour talking to all of you about this subject. Um, I want to thank uh, Corby and Charles and Jonathan and Jeff for joining us today. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining today's inaugural Hearst Community Initiative Town Hall Speaker Series. This presentation was the first of, uh, sorry, the third of eight webinar events broadcasting every two weeks now through the end of July. Uh, you're invited to register for more events in the series at aspen2parachute.org slash events. Aspen, and that's the number two, aspen2parachute.org slash events. 
Our next presentation will be Tuesday, June 1st, from noon to 1 p.m. Mountain Time on the topic of wildfire season, a look at the Colorado River and beyond. Uh, that will feature Scott Fitzwilliams, who's the forest supervisor for the White River National Forest, uh, along with Lathan Johnson and Jim Ginnung, both from the Upper Colorado River Asia Interagency Fire Management Unit, or U UCR. UCR includes Bureau of Land Management and U.S. Forest Service firefighting resources that cover 5.8 million acres along the I-70 uh, corridor along the Colorado and Roaring Fork River corridors from the Continental Divide to the Utah State Line. The UCR includes the White River National Forest and the BLM's Colorado River Valley and Grand Junction field offices. Uh, the UCR cooperates with other federal and state agencies uh, local communities and fire departments on a wide range of activities, including fuels, treatments, fire prevention, and suppression. A uh, very, very special thanks to Garfield County Libraries for hosting this series on Zoom. You can find more information on the Aspen Institute's initiatives to engage with the communities of the Roaring Fork and Colorado River Valleys at aspen2parachute.org. I'm Evan Zislas. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.